Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar. Do you like to doom scroll? Are you a prepper? Ladies and gentlemen, these are questions that I asked myself years ago, but now <laughs> I wouldn't say that I'm a doom scrolling kind of guy, but I do prep for a lot of scary things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, yesterday, okay, I was just minding my own business. Everything was hunky dory until of course the United States government posts this, uh, this right here. Today, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence has made available to all members of Congress information concerning a serious national security threat. I am requesting that President Biden declassify all information relating to this threat so that Congress, the administration, and our allies can openly discuss the actions necessary to respond to this threat. Now, I live like an hour away from the United States, okay? You know, from New York. Uh, New York State, rather, not the city. But ladies and gentlemen, that makes that makes me a little scared. I think, you know, when I think of the world ending, the only person that I think can keep a little umbrella over my head is the United States. And when they tell me, you know, everything's about to hit the fan, then of course I get a little bit freaked out. Obviously, this is a little panic-inducing, but I want to dispel a little bit of your guys', you know, panic a little bit, okay? You can't control the world, all right? This is how I choose to accept the existential crisis we live with. Look, you can't control everything, okay? If a nuke is about to hit you, if the world is gonna end, if there are viruses, if a meteor is about to strike the world FF7 style, then you know what? All you can do is sit back, relax, hold the hand with the loved one, and just say, you know what? At the end of the day, it is what it is. And that's how I choose to live my life every day. Every day could be an end, you know? Every day could be done. Aliens could come to the planet and enslave us. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't really care. Once something is out of my control, I really couldn't care about the consequences for it. Live your every day like it's basically your last, is how I say it, okay? And if you can convince yourself of that, life becomes a lot more sweeter. But anyways, existential crisis subsiding aside, let's get back to the meat and potatoes of this. So I wanted to really understand what was this serious national security threat? I mean, you can't just say this and then walk away, all right? You, you better start explaining to us, Representative Mike Turner. This guy's from Ohio. You know how messed up Ohio is, ladies and gentlemen? It's a lot. Ohio is one of the weirdest, you know, people say Florida's a weird state. I'd say Ohio's a weirder state too, okay? Shit, it gave us the Paul brothers for crying out loud. Now, this moment in time, I started looking at, you know, approved news sources, and I found one, Politico. It said, warning from the House Intel is about Russia's space power. Oh no. Now, space power could be a lot of things. Do they find out how to interdimensionally travel? Or is it something more sinister in regards to weapons? Probably the latter. So fun fact, these guys actually don't really say a whole lot. It's just speculation. It's possible that they were attempting to raise alarms about Russia's advancements in space. I think we need a little bit more, so I decided to go to Canada. Now, the CBC, the United States briefs Canada and other allies about the Russian nuclear threat. Okay, all right, that gets scary. That, <laughs> that freaks me out a little bit. So ladies and gentlemen, this is pretty fresh, updated two hours ago, so you know they're not screwing around. Now, this is according to the New York Times, okay? Pretty reputable source, I'd say. Uh, you know, but for most people, I'd say most people would agree on that. Some would say that it's propaganda, but then again, we're getting into, we're getting into these debates, okay? And I don't really feel like jumping into a debate today. The New York Times, citing unnamed officials, ah, oh, that's great, reporting Wednesday that the United States revealed new intelligence about Russian nuclear capabilities. Oh, that could pose an international threat? A senior source with direct knowledge of the briefing confirmed that Canada was among the allies briefed by the issues. Yay! We report, yay! Citing a current and former U.S. official, the newspaper reported that new intelligence was related to Russia's attempts to develop a space-based anti-satellite nuclear weapon. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's scary. Current and former officials said the nuclear weapon was not in orbit. So clearly developing something and having it in space are two entirely different things, right? So I wanna get into a bit of loss for you. Now, before some of y'all were born, there was an Outer Space Treaty of 1967, basically signed by every important country at the time. Signed in you know London, signed in Moscow, signed in Washington, DC. In fact, from what it is, there's 114 parties to this. And of course, those parties are, again, all the countries at the time that were like, you know, big spacefaring organizations. And we kind of all sat down and decided what happens in outer space, right? 
Now, according to this treaty, one thing that is actually quite important is recalling Resolution 1884, calling upon states to refrain from placing in orbit around the Earth any object carrying nuclear weapons or any other kind of weapon of mass destruction or from installing such weapons on celestial bodies. So no, we can't make a Death Star on the moon, okay? We literally all, all agreed that was wrong, okay? All right, all of us said that was bad. White phosphorus, debatable. It depends if we want to use it or not. Nuclear weapons on the space, no, 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 no. We all said that was wrong, which was adopted unanimously by the United Nations General Assembly on the 17th October, 1963. We literally all said the exploration and the use of space, including the moon and any other body, should be carried out for the benefit and interests of all countries. That's how you know it's BS. We're not, we're not going to work together. It's not happening, Lois. It's not. Outer space, including the moon, shall be free for exploration or use by all states without discrimination of any kind. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure the U.S. Space Force is not going to start colonizing things, but hey, you know, but hey, I could be wrong. Now, to give you an idea, if any country decides to do this and put, like, actual nuclear weapons in space, that, from my understanding, can be considered an act of actual war, okay? So most countries, in fact, you know, all the countries probably wouldn't want to do this. And I believe it's because of this actual treaty and these actual agreements that even during the Cold War, a lot of laser-based missiles, a lot of actual laser-based technology or, you know, space, uh, you know, warfare technology was actually sort of thrown away during the height of the space war from both sides of the Iron Curtain, okay? So, and again, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. My Cold War history isn't all that great, but this is just me looking into, again, how the world could potentially end. And obviously, you know, when we're talking about nuclear weapons and the potentiality for them being in space and violating actual agreed upon acts, this is a serious escalation, one that we should be very careful and one that we should keep an actual eye on, okay? This isn't a joke, ladies and gentlemen. This is actually some really scary stuff we're looking into. Now, what the hell is a satellite, anti-satellite nuclear weapon? To give you an idea, this is something known as Starfish Prime, right? Starfish Prime was a high-altitude nuclear test conducted by the United States, and what this actually helped prove was the EMP effects of a nuclear weapon. So, for instance, you can see an image of a debris fireball stretching across Earth's magnetic field with an airglow aurora as seen at three minutes from a surveillance aircraft. Yep. And, of course, if you look into it, this was a series of five tests grouped together as something known as Operation Fishbowl. So again, to look around over here, this is an image of Starfish Prime through Honolulu. So yeah, if you live near Hawaii, I guess you guys, I guess you, I guess at the time you must get some amazing views of how <laughs> of the end of the world almost, right? Some little glimpses. So at some point in this situation, Starfish Prime, an explosion here, caused an electromagnetic pulse (EMP) that was far larger than expected. So much larger that it drove much of the instrumentation off scale, causing great difficulty in getting accurate measurements. The Starfish Prime electromagnetic pulse was also made those effects known to the public by causing electrical damage in Hawaii, about 900 miles away from the detonation point, knocking out about 300 streetlights, setting off numerous burglar alarms, and damaging a telephone company's microwave link. So yeah, this was more than they expected, and it's an idea to understand that if you let a nuke off in space, yes, it can not shut down serious infrastructure because of these effects. And it's why having some weapon in space that can cause this kind of damage in act of war is because as you all know, something about nuclear weapons is mutually assured destruction. So Matt, now, MAD is a theory that if one country launches its nuclear arsenal, the other also launches in retaliation. In fact, it's not even as simple as that. Every country launches its nuclear arsenal. With the amount of nuclear weapons that just the United States and the Russian Federation have, it's enough weapons to take out the world several times over. As scary as that sounds, that's how many nuclear weapons we all made. And even with disarming and throwing them away, we still have so much that it can destroy the world once again several times over. You might be wondering why a country needs to build that many weapons. Well, <laughs> the military industrial complex, look that up, ladies and gentlemen, these things cost a boatload of money to make. But the point is, and there's not just two countries that are, you know, nuclear armed. You've got multiple other countries that are equipped as well. So if one country decides to go crazy and hit the kill switch, 
everyone hits the kill switch and the world is effectively over. Nuclear weapons are obviously, you know, they're not new in the sense that obviously they've been pre-programmed for a while now. We all know where Moscow is, we all know where Washington DC is, we all know where New York, Toronto, Los Angeles, Tokyo, every big city. And obviously all these cities are targeted by all of these, you know, nuclear owning countries. And again, the reality of it is, is you sit, this is the scariest part about it every day. I think about this every day, I'm not even joking. When you wake up and you live near a major city, it's kind of like sitting, you know, every day with a barrel, a gun barrel aiming down your forehead. And again, you don't expect that gun to ever fire, but it exists, right? So at a moment when these nukes go off, it takes roughly 20 minutes, according to, you know, uh, some analysis for some of these nuclear weapons, these ICBMs, it takes 20 minutes for a trip. That is 20 minutes to cross thousands of miles because the average distance, the average travel time is like 12 to 14,000 miles per hour. So when you look at something like nuclear map, for instance, which I've always referenced this, but there's other maps that you can try to, like missile map, for instance. We're not gonna try this for now, okay? So right now, that is my city. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna center it right to Toronto, go right there. That is Toronto downtown. Now imagining if some country has this targeted, which they probably do, the earliest, the smallest bomb would have taken down downtown and the worst radiation effects would have hit as far as downtown Young, little Tokyo. But let's say that we actually use a real bomb, okay? Let's say we use the Dongfeng-4, China's first deployed ICBM. No, actually we'll upgrade to the Dongfeng-5, all right? We're gonna detonate that. As you all know, Toronto is evaporated. The fireball radius literally means anybody in that organ and anybody in that location burnt to a crisp, gone, vaporized, okay, deleted. The moderate, moderate, moderate blast damage, all right, right over here, this is where most residential buildings collapse, injuries are universal, and fatalities are widespread. And of course, the damage doesn't stop even until you get to like Oakville, okay? Like the suburbs, beyond the suburbs of Toronto. Even over here, people are going to be experiencing some level of destruction. But of course, this is a rough map. It's obviously going to be different. You know, weather is going to be changing a couple things around. It will be different, okay? It will obviously have some variances. But this is a rough idea of how bad things can get. And of course, just for the sake of it, if you use the SAR Bomba, for instance, dog, everyone here is dead, okay? Bomb goes off in Toronto, dudes in Buffalo be feeling the pressure. So yeah, this is, again, a situation you don't want to be in, okay? This is a bad, bad environment. This is how destructive nuclear weapons end up being. Now, of course, when fired off in space, I don't expect those attacks to affect us, but if it shuts down critical infrastructure like with an EMP, then obviously satellites go offline, the ability to understand. Now to whittle this on back before I go off into the nuke map like I usually do, the thing about violating mutually assured destruction is it's also an act of actual war. See, to disable a satellite means that you're disabling the capabilities of detection. See, when you actually, like, when, when a nuclear weapon gets fired, the government doesn't immediately, immediately from my, my understanding, know that a nuclear weapon is flying. It takes a couple of minutes for them to relay that through a satellite, through a, through a, uh, through, through their um, sensors, that something is flying towards them. At that moment in time, they've got like, again, that 20 minute time frame. It's call the president, make sure that we're also responding, you know, hit the nuke button as well. And then it's also sending out an emergency alert to everyone around them. So one of my favorite types of content, and I have a video about this later on too, more dedicated, is the emergency alert scenario. So this one is by a channel known as The Animators, and I just wanna stress that what you're about to see is a work of fiction, not real, video just made for fun, just so nobody gets panicked about it. And this is about something that you'll be seeing on your TV screens, okay, if you lived in the 1980s. The places in which the police aren't nearby, a siren will sound to warn people and if they are in the blast zone and evacuate to safety. For people in Washington, D.C., if you are in a 10 mile area of those cities, evacuate now. Failure to do so will result into certain death. That's some real chilling stuff right there. People are always talking about, ooh, this analog series is scary. No, I would say the scariest thing in the world is what human beings have devised. And that's so many like insane weapons of mass destruction that when it actually comes towards us, all you can do is just give people the few minutes of warning time because that really is all you have, a few minutes until the post-apocalypse becomes the reality. But yeah, of course, if you get rid of sensors, then the ability for governments 
to figure this out is going to be gone. And that alone is an act of aggression. If you take away the eyes, we can only assume the worst. So obviously the situation's kind of escalated, but I really don't think on a personal level that there's going to be any form of World War III at this point, um, just because I feel like every party has everything to lose. You know, back in the old days, back in the days of World War II, World War I, uh, there was an understanding that obviously, you know, these things were pretty much kept to a local region, but nowadays with the ability to destroy the world at literally within, within a 30 minute time frame, less than an episode of SpongeBob it takes to end the world, all of human history. I think most countries think twice about escalating something. There might be threats, there might be obvious like slight escalations, but I really don't think we're gonna get to a point where the world ends. But again, I could be wrong, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, when, when World War III happens, it will be the final war of humanity. At that moment in time, the cockroaches will come out and take the rest of the world over. But yeah, this whole situation is something that's been in, you know, basically like mired in new conspiracy theories. And as far as we know, there's actually nothing in space as of now. There's no actual weapon. But for now, there is at least some understanding that there might be researches going on into disabling satellite capabilities, which is really, really scary, okay? A lot of these satellites are designed for countries to remain vigilant. And if you take that away, then obviously the next step is trying to, you know, actually like push for a war. Why would a country try to take away that satellite capability? That's all we really have to worry about. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, let it be known that there's a strong amount of men and women out there that are doing their absolute best to make sure that the world keeps going on to the next actual day. And hopefully, I hope they keep on winning, as should you. But ladies and gentlemen, this is the crazy Russia space nuke story that's been going on the last 24 hours. The one story that's kind of had me on an existential spiral too. But ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar, and if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it. Don't be worried. You know, ladies and gentlemen, what's out of your future is out of your future. What's out of your hands is out of your hands. Just relax, make the world a better place as much as you can with your own effort day to day. Make sure the people around you know that you love them and, you know, vice versa. And that's really all that you can do. Live every day like it's your last. Because goddamn, the politicians do not make living every day fun. But this is me, Mudahar, and I am out.